Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Steve Jobs once said, technology is nothing. What's important is that you have faith in people, that they're basically good and smart, and if you give them tools, they'll do wonderful things. Today's panel is going to look at the use of augmented reality and virtual reality technologies, discussing the value of these tools and what they're bringing to the enterprise and consumer market, as well as looking at what needs to be removed in order for these technologies to realize their full market potential. You have already uh, heard a lot about me. Uh, my name is Tom Emmerich, and I will be moderating this panel. With me uh, in this discussion, we have John Ludwig, who is the product lead for VR at HP, Amy Peck, who is the Senior Director of Enterprise Content at HTC Vive, and Silke Meisnix, who is the Head of Emerging Design at Adobe. Now, before we begin our discussion, I'm gonna give each of our panelists some time to introduce themselves to you. Uh, and then I'll, I'll let you in on how you're going to be able to join in on this conversation uh, via an audience Q&A tool that we have going on today. So John, maybe you can start. Cool. Hey all, my name is John Ludwig. I'm the lead product manager at HP for VR. Uh, that means I set our roadmap and I own our business results. Uh, before that HP, I, I grew the uh, Owen Gaming business for about three years before we started off the enterprise VR business. Nice. Uh, and I'm Amy Peck. I am at HTC Vive. I'm actually on the content side, so I am focused entirely on solutions for enterprise and really looking at how companies can leverage hardware and software together uh, throughout their workflow. I'm Silke Meisnix. I'm head of emerging design at Adobe, as Tom said. So my responsibility and what I care deeply about is the tools that we give enterprises, designers in enterprises, uh, to create immersive experiences or experiences using emerging technologies like augmented reality. I've been in this field for about 10 years now. Thank you, everybody. And so we do have some time uh, dedicated to audience Q&A. To make this much more efficient, we're using a web browser app called Slido. So if you have an audience question, uh, throughout the panel discussion, you can go to sli.do or sli.do on your smartphone browser, use the event code 1160 or 1160, and I will be able to see your questions here on my magical device and I'll be weaving them into the conversation as it makes sense. So I think the instructions are behind me. Uh, it's sly.do and I use the event code 1160. I can't wait to hear what you want me to ask. So let's uh, begin our conversation. Uh, you know, in the consumer space, we hear a lot about Beat Saber and Pokemon Go, of course, um, as well as spewing rainbow filters. And at a quick glance, uh, the AR VR consumer ecosystem and space could seem like it's just filled with gimmicks and games. Is this really the case or what other areas are we seeing delivering value for the consumers from these technologies? Well, I'll go first. Let's not slander gaming quite yet. <laughs> uh, you know, I think we had to split it into two factors is are we delivering value in terms of you know, revenue for VR and AR and are we delivering value for humanity in VR AR? If, if all VR AR becomes is gaming, well, that's gonna be a $300 billion business in 2025. So we're all gonna be okay. We're gonna still have jobs, <laughs> which is awesome. But, and, you know, there's a lot of companies that just do gaming inputs like mice and keyboards, and they, they do great. So VR AR shouldn't feel worried. But it can be so much more than that for humanity. So when we look at things like training, right? Yes, you can deliver value. It's a $90 billion industry in the US. But how do you improve it for people who aren't getting trained today? VR allows so many more options now for people. Or you look at like PTSD uh, and how well VR is improving the lives of those people. So I don't think it's just purely about money, but also it's a question about are we delivering value for humanity as well? Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think um, you know it's a burgeoning market, um, but certainly in enterprise and relative to um, VR, we are seeing, for instance, healthcare and wellness, right? That is directly touching the consumer. So pain mitigation therapies, um, different kinds of wellness applications, um, you know, all kinds of um, behavioral science, uh, you know, applications around addiction and therapies. 
So certainly, you know, AR and VR for good. I, I see, you know, sort of endless opportunities. Um, and it's a, it comes to utility. You know, I think um, we, we're focused on this killer app notion, which I think is kind of slightly a fundamentally flawed view. It's going to be killer utility, right? So it needs to be useful. It needs to be, you know, on demand. And it needs to be fun, right, for consumers to really engage with this type of content. Mm. Delka? Yeah, uh, the areas, and I agree, it's, it's got to be fun as well to actually break the ice. There's some really good examples of that. Microsoft, when they introduced the mouse, built the, a little Tetris game. Just and the game helped people get used to using the mouse. And I think this is the Pokemon Go is a good example of that, to just sort of break the ice into the possibilities. But at Adobe, what we care about, what we think a lot about is content creation and also content engagement. So when we're thinking about content creation, say in augmented reality, we've put quite a bit of effort and money and, and made some big bets in that area and built a tool called Aero. Um, we've also bought a couple of companies recently called Algorithmic, which is a big uh, company, big reputation in the games industry, but we can bring that into making content for 3D content for augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and consumer engagement is, is when we think about how our customers are using the tools that they're, they're creating, the experiences using our tools, and then their customers use those experiences. So we also think about the ad um, and anal analytics of how people use the augmented reality and virtual reality tools as well. So they're the three kind of pillars that we look at when we're thinking about content creation. And maybe oh, yeah. talk a little bit about um, the differences in creating 3D realities versus you know, the, what we're used to currently, which is a lot of 2D content. Uh, you know, what does the consumer uh, need to be equipped with? What, what type of thinking changes in this instance? Because mm. uh, I think that this is really where the shift is when we talk about content creation. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And I think we tend to underestimate how hard it is to shift a cultural norm or a a uh, behavior, existing behavior, and we're spending a lot of effort teaching designers who are used to working in 2D space to now design in a 3D space. And that's actually a lot more effort than we realize. Um, and I think that's a good lesson to learn from for everybody else. But we're seeing such a high rate of engagement when something is put in the world, when something is three dimension and the consumer can interact with it that people are spending the time and the effort to create that content. Um, and we're investing and even create a whole department just to focus on that 3D interactive content creation. Mm. Mm. And I, I love that. I mean, uh, I've always um, said that some of the early um, use cases for consumers is in the democratization of special effects and giving, uh, you know, giving the, the end user the tools to be able to create content that uh, typically a professional would only have access to, you know, just a couple years back. Yeah. And, you know, we're seeing that especially in the social AR space with filters, which, you know, I started the, the, the first question off um, indicating that these things are gimmicks, but really they're not. It's kind of like I'm tongue cheek there. Um, the, the filters are a really important baby step to help to groom consumers to better understand how to leverage 3D, use 3D, the fact that 3D exists. Mm. Um, and so I think content creation is like such a core um, first big step towards um, uh, seeing AR as something that needs to be in your life on a regular basis. And I think it, it resonates um, to us as humans because as humans we're innate mm. storytellers. That's right, yeah. 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 Well, it's funny because um, you know, we talk about social AR I think you were the one who introduced me to this whole cadre of AR artists on Instagram, which is like 4,000 hours I'm not getting back, so thank <laughs> you. Um, but what's remarkable about it is the community that has formed around user-generated design. And this mm -hmm. notion of the democratization of the tools, but then this sort of instant gratification that you have this audience and I think if we start to look at the future of 
not just everybody is, is a designer, but everyone is as an influencer, mm. which is kind of where all this social behavior is going. I think that confluence of these tools that you're building, mm. we're gonna see things that we never dreamed of yeah. in this 3D That's landscape. Right. I think it's interesting to look at the justification. Like when we look at an enterprise challenge that we have, a large con customer will come to us and want to like improve productivity. Um, how do we do motion capture of the 9,000 products per day that we get in um, and we need to sell? Uh, so how, what are the tools that we create to help um, uh, scan objects, clean them up, put them out and distribute them widely across all the different networks? Um, and that one small efficiency there is a huge gain for them. And then completely the opposite perspective from the engagement perspective, and this is the area that I particularly enjoy, is we're challenged to think a little further ahead, like what is gener the generations beyond us? How are they, and I have two children who are 10 and 11, and the way they think about creating content mm -hmm. is my inspiration and also many people in Adobe, how are we going to learn from the way they think and behave and TikTok and mm -hmm. Pokemon and they're just, um, uh, we should be looking to them to think about how they want to communicate in the future um, and build our tools that help that. And, and I really love way. the fact that we're starting off some of this conversation highlighting mobile AR. I know that at yeah. Spy a lot of the focus is on headsets. Um, but I would really encourage anybody in the optics and photonics industry to really take a look at what's happening in mobile um, because there are a lot of foundational um, um, uh, elements coming into play within the consumer space particularly that, it, that is going to inform um, what the use cases are for headsets. You know, and, and uh, filters um, and creation tools are, are one example. On, on the eighth wall side, we have many marketers and advertisers leveraging web AR to help engage users with their brand in a way that's not possible with video um, or possible with display banners, increasing dwell time significantly. And, and that's because of the, this content, this reality content, is all about experience at a time when we're in the experience economy. And John, I wanted to talk to you a bit about um, experience, because I know HP does a lot of work uh, within LBE, location-based entertainment, um, and which is, uh, uh, has a lot to do with gaming as well. So I, I thought maybe you could enlighten us what's happening in that space. You know, everyone's always looking for how they can deliver more value. When you go talk to Hollywood, right, they've been putting out movies for a long time, but they need to grow their businesses. Uh, and so they're always looking for what's the next big thing. 3D movies, did it happen? I don't know, I still don't like 3D movies very much. Um, and so VR is one place they've really looked towards the next stage of how we get people more immersed into our, you know, our property rights so I can keep selling them more experiences, I can sell them more accessories after the fact. And so what we found a lot is the Hollywood companies trying to get their IP into location-based entertainment where you know, we sell these crazy VR backpacks that cost like $3,000. They weigh about 10 pounds, but you forget about them once you're in the experience and you're, you know, you're fighting the Terminator. Um, but what's really important to those customers is less so, you know, these people running the LBE is, is how do I deliver the most amazing experience? Because I'm trying to get customers out of their houses, drive out to my location, pay $40 for an hour of entertainment, which is a really tough ask. You have to deliver a lot of value to get a customer to drive all the way to the mall and spend $40. So what we really focused on is, is you know, comfort and improving that you know, resolution and experience so people can be more immersed. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it's at this, these days. And, and that's a good segue into the next uh, part of this discussion on the consumer space that I wanted to talk about, which is the challenges that need to be removed. And this especially, I think, has to do a little bit more with the headsets. Uh, you know, we've seen some leaps and bounds on consumer devices. Um, as you mentioned, John, they're getting more comfortable. Uh, in some cases, they're being, uh, you know, untethered from expensive uh, PCs. Uh, on the AR smart glasses side, uh, dare I say, they're looking a little bit more like glasses, which is a big <laughs> thing. Uh, but there still seems to be a, a long ways away for us to get to that point where um, we reach that critical tipping point where these devices are as everyday as smartphones. So what challenges need to be removed, technology, cultural, or otherwise, um, to help really make uh, AR and VR headsets an everyday occurrence? Or a well, regular well, occurrence? Well, I mean, you referenced Steve Jobs, and I think there's definitely an analogy here, because no one was asking for the iPhone. 
right? No one's really asking, except for us, for the magic wayfarers, right? It's just sort of inkling that it's out there. So we have to consider, you know, in the same way that Silk is really looking at, like, what are those behaviors that we're seeing mm. come out of this next generation? And what is the new social paradigm, right? We, we talk about, you know, the negatives and, oh, this is making us very antisocial. I would argue that this is an opportunity to just change the way we socialize and to kind of get in front of that problem. But, you know, and it's, it's architecture. It was the gentleman, the, or the speaker right before us, right? There are elements that we have to solve for, the battery consumption and the optics. Um, but those are all kind of math problems, right? This is what everybody here is solving. What we need to do is sort of create those little stories that people want to see. Mm. And I think it's not just about IP and sort of storytelling and the existing construct. I think it's a blend between designers, um, this game engine mechanics and branching storylines, and Hollywood to create worlds of discovery instead of linear stories, very much like you're seeing in LBE, but much more accessible and much more bite-sized. And I think it's an opportunity just to rethink how we tell stories and how we engage consumers on that entertainment side. I want to, I think both of what you said, I totally agree with. And I'm going to, I see it in three different ways. I see it in, and I'll explain them. One is multi-sensory design. Um, the next is what are the policies that are going to be, have, have to be created for us to move forward. And I have now forgotten the third because I was thinking about explaining them. <laughs> so multi-sensory, I mean, as humans, if somebody can just see, it's hard to communicate with them. If they can just speak, it's hard to communicate with them. If they can just think, it's hard. It's when we combine um, machine sight, machine voice, machine intelligence together, that's when we can really have the human and machine communicating together well. And that's what we're on the sort of brink of seeing that really happen effectively. And with every new major technology that happens, there also is major policies that have to be created. If you think of the railway and you think of electricity and now the internet, we're starting to get policies, but this is something that we need to consider um, how they're going to be used and why um, individually as corporations and as a government. Um, the, the, to be an effective business, to make an, a tool that is actually going to survive and work in the world, you need to think about, I remember the third one, context. <laughs> <laughs> so a good example that everyone knows, um, but I'll illustrate, it's a good illustration, is that um, the Google Glass, when it was put out as a social um, tool to be used for navigation or um, out in the world to film, um, other people, it, it was highly um, hated. But then as soon as it got put and it's been revamped and put into enterprise to solve problems that is very specific and it helps with training, it's been loved and adored. So where you put your tool, where the glasses are, is highly, uh, will make it successful or not. And, and having multimodal, so if somebody wants to speak or they just want to see visuals and they have that choice, the agency to choose how they want to communicate with machine so that they have on their faces or in front of them or in their hands is like a very good, like number one good design principle that we talk about constantly at Adobe. Um, how are we going to give users agency to communicate the way they want in the context that they choose? Um, so there's a design tip. <laughs> You all. And for a more hardware-centric view, because I'm a hardware yeah. guy, uh, it's all about comfort. And that's what's holding back a lot of use cases. And it's comfort both socially as well as physically. Mm -hmm. I mean, today, VR headsets are mostly just a brick strapped to the front of your face. That's just the way it works. And ARs, these big helmets for a lot of times, the ones you can buy. And after about 45 minutes when we do all our testing, you know, most people just want out. No matter how immersive it is, their face is tired from holding up a brick this whole time. Uh, and the way you deliver value is, is how much time you're going to spend in VR if you want to, or AR. If you want to go have these new amazing experiences you guys are building, you're going to wear it for a longer time. And right now, people just won't because uh, it's not comfortable. Mm. But also on the social side, it's pretty weird to be in VR. Uh, we, you know, we, we, 
these days with our headset, you can actually get a decent desktop experience in our headset. And so we've tried working in VR all day long. It's a weird experience. Mm -hmm. And you get like a jump scare when someone comes to try and talk with you and they like, like tap your shoulder, they don't know what to do. Um, so there's two big issues. One, one, we just have to make these things smaller so people are willing to wear them, but also they have to feel socially comfortable wearing these yeah. headsets. You know, every time you go and you say, you go to an architecture firm and you're like, okay, who wants to do the architecture demo in VR? And all the execs in their suits kind of look around and no one volunteers for a second until you look at them. And until we solve both of those, both comfort socially and ergonomically, people just aren't going to use this. Yeah. I, and I, I think I really like that you made that point because it sort of goes along the lines of giving people agency. And a good example of a small change that um, the Quest made, um, who know, who's used the Quest? A few hands. Yeah, a few hands. Uh, it's a VR headset. Um, but you can now switch between being able to see what's around you and then closed off and see the game that you're about to play. But you can switch between the two. And that is giving somebody a choice, which helps with a bit of that problem, not at all completely, but that's a, an example of just design decisions that make a big difference. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, and we started working on this a long time ago when I was at Leap Motion, and we, you know, in our infinite high-tech wisdom duct taped a Leap Motion to the front of a DK1, but leveraging the pass-through video, not necessarily to just write <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun. Um, not necessarily to see your surroundings, um, but to start on a path where we could dynamically render if some other object came into your field of view. And we would render it in the context of the environment so it wasn't like, oh, there's Tom. Um, you know, it might turn out to be like a tiger or whatever, whatever <laughs> the environment is, but at least you'd know that there were some things going on and then mm. you could seamlessly switched to that mode. Now back then, they were webcams and the fidelity was horrifying. Terrible. And if you, I remember. yeah, it was very uh, nausea making, <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's, you know, those, um, that fidelity is gonna get better and better. And we're gonna find, I think, really new and interesting ways to um, kind of really have this sort of true mixed reality. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think also, just speaking of comfort, there's a cultural comfort that needs to be created as well. So I think a lot about the social contracts that are required um, to be built up for both VR, but especially the AR headsets um, that are going to be bringing cameras on people's faces and then those uh, that face tech be, uh, you know, worn uh, in a world where not everybody has um, that device. And it reminds me a lot of, you know, 2005 when the feature phones started getting cameras and there was a lot of banning that was done when the feature phone started to get a camera, mostly because there was an imbalance in yeah. who had a camera. Mm -hmm. And there was an unease in the fact that there was no discussion may, uh, had on what, what, is, what are the rules, what are the social rules on what happens when everybody has a camera in their pocket. And so I think that there, there's a lot of work to be done um, uh, in building these social contracts, both for the AR headsets, which are bringing um, the, uh, the cameras out into the world, but also just in terms of VR and being shut off from the world and, and what it means and how to make people feel safe enough to be able to be in another reality. Um, and I also think like another thing I keep thinking about with um, headsets in particular is we seem to have a conquer the world or nothing, you know, kind of mentality mm -hmm. where, um, you know, we, we need to have an all day, everyday device or we need to always be in VR. Um, and I, I was watching Picard on CBS yesterday and I was uh, remembering how much I love the, the transporter uh, and how they just use it when they need to use it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's right. That's what you do with tools. You don't always have a knife in your hand. You just use the knife to cut the chicken when you need it. And so I think that there's something to be said about also maybe just thinking about these like this, this, these, uh, these um, valuable reasons to use the device and allowing for those to sing. And then what will happen naturally is a developer ecosystem will grow around that and surprise us as to what these devices are, are to be used yeah. for. And I think, I think we saw that with the smartphone which ironically started at work before I came home, right? Mm -hmm. um, as yeah. a Canadian, um, I remember the BlackBerry story. And this is my really amazing segue into changing the conversation into enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> so with the, time, with the time that we have on stage, let's talk about the enterprise. We have mm -hmm. organizations that are reporting upwards of 40% efficiencies in the use of AR and VR in, in the workplace. And, and so what, what industry verticals are leveraging AR and VR to upscale their teams? And if you can, like, if you have any amazing 
um, examples to illustrate how this is disrupting work, I think that the audience would love to hear that. You know, two years ago, when we tried to go sell in VR to enterprises, they were, their first question was, you know, sell us, how can we use VR? You get really sell us. Now it's, it's very much a pull motion. Mm -hmm. We never have to go sell any enterprise on VR, whether it's you know, architecture about, I think we just study about 70% of them say that they have to use VR at this point to win their projects because it's just an expectation from customers that I get to see my building before I actually build it. Wow. I get to make changes. And so it's, it's a very easy selling motion. It's very much a pull now for us, which has been a huge shift. Uh, there's a lot of kind of worry and angst two years ago because we're kind of pushing these things on people and they're kind of pushing back, hey, it's hard to make this work. Mm. And now they're saying, okay, we, look, whether it's training, whether it's architecture, yes, we have to use VR. Yes, we understand we've done the POCs. Mm. Now the friction for us is how do we actually scale it? Because they're going beyond now just the kind of weirdos in the corner doing VR to now it's the <laughs> IT buyer saying, okay, I need to go outfit the whole organization with VR. And you guys focused on gaming and other stuff first, and you don't have you know, the, the device management tools that you need that we're used to. So it's, it's very much what we see as a growing up industry, and we're going through some of the pains where now the value's there, mm -hmm. but we need to go make sure that it's easy for all the IT buyers to actually go utilize this in their enterprise. Yeah, I think scale is the, is the key there, and it's sort of the same thing we're seeing. It's, it's not, um, it's now also sort of scaling across multiple business lines. So if you look at um, kind of building this economy of scale, and I've talked to Silka about this, begging Adobe to build 3D asset management, basically Lightroom for 3D assets, um, because you really start to see economy of scale when you start to re-leverage those assets and environments mm -hmm. and interactions. Um, so I use automotive as an example. So you, know, you can design the car in VR now. Uh, you can take those assets and those can become, um, you know, uh, training, you know, VR training for those who are going to be on the line building that car. Mm -hmm. And then you can give those same assets to the marketing department so they can pre-sell the car. Mm -hmm. And then you can give those to the dealers where they can put it in the showroom where a consumer can build the car of their dreams using a car configurator. Mm -hmm. And you've built that you know, those assets and those environments one time, and then you deployed them across the entire business. And we have stories like that, you know, especially in AEC across every industry. So it's not as much a vertical approach as this now is horizontal approach. And, you know, really kind of leveraging, you know, our understanding of 3D. And we still have a long way to go before the consumer. We live in a 3D world, and yet we're used to these 2D images. Yeah. And so where does that fluency come from? And I know yeah. you think about that a lot. Yeah, it's completely natural for my two kids. Um, and it's completely natural um, for the generations to come. We're still adapting. <laughs> we will. We'll get there. And yet we're so young. It's but <laughs> we hear you about the um, asset optimization and asset distribution and um, thinking about, we are thinking about our tools more and more as a platform. Um, or an integrated um, tools rather than silo tools. And we think that's critical for the future of our business. Um, and it works well in um, one of the challenges for augmented reality and virtual reality is the whole ecosystem needs to work together to some degree to reach mass market. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think a smartphone was a good example that mm -hmm. people completely completely underestimated text messaging, um, became huge, which now led, has led to the social um, world we live in, uh, in smart mobiles. And I, I think we should be asking ourselves if we are totally underestimated smartphones when they were created in 2000, well, before 2008, but let's just say they launched there with the iPhone. Um, what if AR is going to be the next smartphone and it's going to be as huge, I think it'll be bigger, but even thinking about it on that scale, what is the text messaging app going to be? So thinking big and also thinking small is what we are naturally not very good at. So I'm just encouraging to, that, that is how I believe we should be thinking about how we grow the market. Um, 
Going back to Adobe, the areas in enterprise that we focus on is in, in retail, entertainment, and ads. The retail industry um, is $3.6 trillion being made in the US alone, but only five, $500 billion of that is online retail. So the, that's why Amazon's growing 30% per year, Spotify's going through the roof. It's still an untapped market, kind of, even though it's a huge numbers. So we, we are constantly getting pressure. How can we engage our users more? How can we bring them more online? How can we service them? And augmented reality is something that, when the, when the experience is made well, is much easier to understand than current online shopping. You can see the chair in your room and you can just buy it. You know, We're still culturally way behind. We've got a long way to go, but that is kind of the future of retail. Um, and we're thinking about how to build tools and work with our customers to provide them their tools they need as well for their enterprises. Yeah, I think retail is such a great place to, to play yeah. for augmented reality and virtual reality. Yeah. Again, going back to that notion that we've entered the age of experience and the experience economy, mm. retail needing to disrupt itself because of online and mm. uh, the the ability just to buy whenever you want, yeah. uh, whatever you want. And so you need to reimagine what, especially the brick and mortar existence of these brands are. Yeah. Um, you know, I I, uh, I just had my 42nd birthday and I went to Napa. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Birthday. And we went to you Restoration Hardware Restaurant in uh, Napa. Yeah. I don't know if anybody has been there, yes. but to me it was mind blowing. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. and it, was, it was basically me sitting having dinner in their showroom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said to myself, this is the future mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. uh, of retail. Yeah. And it, it's, 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 it, it's going to be taken to the next level utilizing these new realities because yeah. you can do so much more um, with uh, 3D content that is, is not physical. Uh, it, it's not as heavy as a lift to be able to turn your store into, you know, a uh, Hawaiian destination mm -hmm. using AR, provided everybody has a device to look at it, than it is to go and physically make that uh, with props and, and you know, uh, set design. And dynamically change it, like exactly. they do the sky in Vegas, where you just sit there and it becomes day and night and day and night, 20 times while you're having, <laughs> like having dinner. It's, very, it's a little disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but someone who's very close to you is also sort of working on, you know, the, this AR cloud notion where I think we're going to start to sort of hang these experiences, right? We're all already living out loud. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to look at the behaviors uh, around that and how we want to share our experience. So, mm. you know, I might, you know, have this kind of 3D experience and record myself you know, either in a real or a digital environment. And then I might leave this little experience droplet, right, somewhere mm -hmm. for my friends to discover. And, you know, we need to really start to project ourselves, you know, and, and talk to our kids mm. and see, you know, with, is that interesting to you? And, and does that seem natural mm -hmm. you know, mm. for, for them to experience, you know, our, our little droplets that way? Right. Right, right. John, um, uh, you mentioned that, that you have this like pull for VR, which I love, this demand. That's such a good sign. I know you said your, um, your focus is a lot on the hardware. So um, what, what, if any, are the um, enterprise clients demanding change on the hardware side of, of VR uh, devices? Well, if you, if you looked in the past two years, they would have said, I want a thin and light VR computer because as you went out and you said, hey, you're going to need a VR-ready PC to go run your, your, your CAD file in VR. And I'll say, OK, well, what's a laptop look like? You're like well, it's at $2,500 and it weighs about 12 pounds. And then they're kind of like, ugh. Um, the great sign is you know, technology keeps improving. You know, about a year ago, we took a big step down. And now you can get good VR performance out of a 15-inch notebook at a reasonable price. Next year, we're going to take another big step down. So it's not only the VR headsets that are improving. But as you look at companies, it's going from only we have one VR-ready PC to now we have many VR-ready PCs. Mm -hmm. And next year, in a couple of years, it's transitioning to every employee has a VR-ready PC. Of course, your PC is VR-ready uh, because it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. It just takes time. Yeah. Um, and so I know right now everyone's all excited about ARM, AR, and VR. And it's kind of the year of ARM with the Oculus Quest doing great. But we really see that x86 
and PCs are where a lot of these enterprises, they have their existing applications, whether it be their training, their architecture, their CAD files, and now slowly all their employees are having VR-ready PCs, and so it just makes a lot more natural sense for them to start bringing in more VR headsets, more AR headsets that run on these laptops they are already carrying. Mm -hmm. And so that's honestly probably one of the biggest drivers we're seeing mm -hmm. of enterprise adoption at this point is just the expansion of VR-ready PCs available in the enterprise. And I, I love that thinking about, again, going back to not having to conquer the world, but leveraging the, the constellation of devices that are continually getting mm -hmm. better, that are around us. Yeah. Um, it's, not an, it's not an either or, it's all. And so I think uh, just as you mentioned with, with the laptop or the PC, um, you know, assisting the VR device to be all that it can, I, I think that we're starting to see that come together with the AR uh, eyewear and it being a smartphone accessory first rather than it being an all-in-one device um, that is going to remove the need to have a smartphone. So I think like thinking about that, what are the what are the puzzle pieces that are already in existence within the enterprise, within the consumer space that we can piggyback on in order to give an AR VR experience? Mm -hmm. Something I find really interesting, something that has just been going through my mind. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit of my mind. <laughs> Uh, bear with me. Um, I kind of see the car as like a big VR headset in the fact that it has all the sensors that currently headsets do have. And it's a good example of what's been out there now for a while. A lot of cars do have sensors in them. In fact, when I think of something as a bit boring, um, like the beeping to get back in your lane because it's sensing whether I'm, you know, moving too far to one lane or the other or getting too close to someone in front and you go, oh, that's annoying, then you know that it's mainstream. But things go through this hype cycle and Benedict Evans, who's a very prominent VC and um, quite a, somebody people listen to, um, some people don't, but most people do. <laughs> um, he, he explained it simply that new technologies come in at this cycle at the bottom, they're stupid. <laughs> then they go to the middle part where everything's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where we are a lot right now. Everything's exciting. And I've been in this field for 10 years, it's still exciting. But then it gets to the point where it gets boring yeah. and it's starting to go up. So I'd see like the sensors that tell me I'm changed, moving too close to the line of the road is boring. And when it gets to that point, you know that there's enough people, there's enough cars around you in this case that have those sensors. And the question then is, what can we do with this? Mm -hmm. Now we've got all this data. Can, we, can the cities now build better infrastructures to make road safer and cars safer and like when you start having that sort of ubiquity then you can start to see like social um, influence these technologies can have in a good way they also can be bad but we can make them into a good way if we put our heads together um, and so I just wanted to put that thought out there yeah, but I think also you touched on something that's really important that we tend to miss because I you know I go to these conferences and we have tracks right so we're in the AR VR MR track and there might be an AI track, there might be a blockchain track, there might be an autonomous vehicle track. Yeah. The reality is, is that you know, it's gonna be the confluence of all of these technologies. Yeah. And you know, so in an autonomous vehicle, you could, you know, if you were truly, when it's truly autonomous, you will be able to change your drive time environment. You will be able to you know, access uh, your work in your field of view. You'll be able to you know, you know, have your hologram of your child pop in and you can play them a game, you know, a game with them. Uh, you know, and then all of this data that the autonomous vehicles are collecting through LIDAR, you know, they're throwing away data that's not relevant to the scene, but that data they're throwing away is going to true up the AR cloud. Yeah. And then our transactions and our wants and our needs and our privacy settings uh, will live on the blockchain. And we're going to use AI to sort of be the checks and balance between, you know, the efficacy of all of these programs. So again, not to get too far in front, but I know we talk about this a lot, but it's like we, you know, we need to think about this sort of global change in behavior, leveraging all of this amazing technology at our fingertips. I actually want to ask John, can I ask you a question? Can you build this for us? Breaking rules. <laughs> um, is there an example of the sensor for lane changing in enterprise? You can see like even one small thing that is just so widely used. No. As well as you. So it's still early? What was the question? <laughs> Maybe you can rephrase it, Tom. Uh, uh, I, it's echoey, so I can't hear all the way over here. Uh, can you okay. repeat it? 
Is there a system that is being used so much for so long that it's kind of ubiquitous mm. in enterprise? Like, uh, I'm not going to give you examples. Maybe the... It's okay to say no. No. I think I think no. Everyone has their own specific. The, the nice thing about VR and AR is that yeah. they're platforms that go horizontally, mm -hmm. and each person they're all using the same headset today because we only have you only have so many choices. Yeah. And no one's using anything that's so ubiquitous. Okay. They all build their own kind of unique flavor on top. Okay. But I am glad that Silka asked a question because unfortunately yes. no one from the audience used our Slido. I was checking. Oh. Uh, <laughs> So we did get one question. We've run out of time, and uh, hopefully uh, we've given you some insight into the user, the consumer user, the enterprise user. Um, if you're working in optics and photonics, I, I love and thank you, Bernard, and, and the organizing team, um, that you've, you've put us on stage to uh, seed this discussion and this topic as part of your agenda here at this conference. And I want to thank uh, my panelists here on stage for joining me in this conversation. And hopefully you can find us and, um, and uh, ask us more questions if you, you, you weren't able to use Slido um, out there uh, today. So have a great rest of the conference, everybody. Thank you.